Welcome, brothers and sisters, to church today. It's great that we can be here together and I give God thanks that you can join us today. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Simon, if I haven't met you before, and also I'd like to welcome Sashi this morning. Welcome, Sashi. Oh, thanks, Simon. Um, it's great to be here. And isn't it great that we have the technology that allows us to zoom straight into people's lounge rooms? Um, but you know what's even more exciting is that as of next Sunday, uh, we'll have people in the pews here, people in the seats. Uh, and I'm pretty excited about that. Me too. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I was thinking about that um, this week, I recalled a passage in Hebrews um, that talked about that. So can I read that to you, Simon? Please. Excellent. Um, it's from Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm just reading verses 22 to 25. It says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, having our heart sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Hmm. Amen. Thanks so much, Sashi. That's a great verse to kick things off. Now, before we continue, please pray with me. Father God, we thank you and praise you for making the world. And we thank you and praise you for making us and giving us life, life and breath, but also life through your amazing son. Now help us to draw near to you this morning with glad and sincere hearts. Father, we thank you that we've been able to persevere in meeting together. And may your hand be upon the service today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Sashi, guess what? What? It's time for our kids and big kids time. Oh, can I be part of it? Yes. I would love you to be part of it. Thanks so much. Now, today we're going to talk about the topic wisdom. Okay. Now, this is what wisdom is. Hmm. Someone who is wise has knowledge. But also wisdom is not just about knowledge. A wise person puts that knowledge into practice mm. for example if you make a sensible decision mm. that is known as a wise decision mm. so simon is eating vegetables wise well i actually got some carrots in my pocket because everyone carries carrots in their pocket don't absolutely. they absolutely it's pretty normal now i know that this carrot is healthy Mm. but a wise person eats their vegetables. They just don't know. They know it, but actually a wise person will eat their vegetables. Oh, cool. I've got another question. Is it wise to wear a bike helmet? Well, I know that a helmet's going to protect my head when mm. I'm on my bike and if I fall off and have a crash or if a magpie comes. So I know it, but a wise person will actually wear their helmet. Even if it looks a bit silly. Even if it looks silly and even if it's not cool, mm. they will still wear their helmet. Mm. Mm. And Simon, is following Jesus wise? Well, I know that following Jesus is good, but a wise person, Sashi, will obey Jesus. Mm. And what does the Bible say? Uh, where, where do we get wisdom from, Simon? Where do we get wisdom from? Well, believe it or not, boys and girls, I am not the source of wisdom. So you can breathe a sigh of relief there. But where do we get wisdom from? Great question. Well, wisdom comes from God. Mm -hmm. That's where we get wisdom from. So let's see what it says in the Bible about that. Now, let me read to you from James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God. And then again in James chapter 3, verse 13, it says this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, 
by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Mm. Mm. That reminds me, Simon, do you know there's a guy, in, um, well, it's not just a guy, he's a king in the Bible called Solomon. And God once asked him, you know, what do you want? Like, ask me anything and I'll give it to you. And do you know what Solomon asked for? I know. Mm. He asked for horses. Good answer, but no. Okay, I'll try again. Mm. He asked for lots of treasure. Ooh. That's what I'd ask for. Yeah. Um, no, he didn't ask for that oh, either. Okay. Well, let me try again. I mm. think I got this Third one. Time I'm a pretty lucky, wise Simon. man. I reckon he asked for a new Nintendo. Simon, it wasn't even invented back oh, then. Okay, yeah. No, right. Solomon asked God for wisdom so he could rule God's people wisely. And, you know, God was so delighted that he asked for wisdom that not only did Solomon get lots of wisdom and he was known for being wise, but God gave him a whole lot of other blessings as well. And it seems like a good thing to ask God for wisdom. So can Absolutely. I ask for all of us now? Please do, Sashi. Great. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are the fount of wisdom and that you are delighted to give us wisdom when we ask for it. And Lord, we ask that now for all of us, that you would give us your wisdom, that we may uh, walk in this world as salt and light, that we may honour and glorify your name and be your Christ ambassadors in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, yeah, for giving us wisdom. Right. We're going to have a worship song now, and this worship song is called Wisdom. Uh, so please worship along with us as we have this song. Mm -hmm. There is something that's better than the latest toy There is something that never can be destroyed It's worth more than jewels and gold or anything money can buy To go astray But in the Bible You reveal Your perfect way You teach me to think like you Instead of being a fool Don't wanna be that W-I-S-T-O-M Spells wisdom I need it W-I-S-T-O-M In your world I find it I need your wisdom Lord I wanna love it, live it, learn it, read it. W I S T O N. I wanna know it, think it, speak it, breathe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. W I S T O N spells wisdom, and I need it. W Brothers and sisters, we're going to continue to get wisdom now as we read from God's word. I'll be reading from Psalm 15 to begin with. Uh, let me pray again. Father God, we thank you that your word is living and active. Father, we pray that your living and active work 
uh, will do its work in our souls today by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 15, a psalm of David. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbour and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honours those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. The gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 18, and I'm going to read verses 18 to 30. Uh, Jesus often spoke in parables and spoke to his disciples and the crowd. And in the crowd, there was someone who asked this question. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandment. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All this I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard then said, who then can be saved? And Jesus replies, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them. No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once again, we are about to start our third uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, our third lesson, our third message on uh, the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. I must say, though, before we start, I'm really looking forward to having us all back next week. It's far more um, warm, isn't it, to be able to see eyes and see smiles and see faces, um, see responses, give responses, and we'll be able to share in that next week. And I hope you're feeling as uh, happy and anticipatory about rejoining together as I am. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you set some bars in our lives, Lord, that are hard because there's a lordship of you in our lives. But Lord, you don't ask us to do anything you haven't done. In fact, far less. So we would pray, Lord, at this time that you'll touch our hearts, that we'll grow in our devotion and service of you. Because we love you, Lord, and we want to be with you. Amen. So I've done a deal with Stuart today, and it's already working. I am not touching the PowerPoint. And uh, I trust that's going to uh, <clears throat> eliminate all the, the errors that happen during these messages I've been bringing. And of course, next week, we'll be together again. And the, mes the messages, I trust, will flow because of the dynamic of having us uh, all together. But nevertheless, Stuart's uh, been very kind and ha helping me out this morning with these PowerPoints. So we're up to Lordship Law number three. 
Obedience is the result of salvation, not the cause of it. We're saved by grace. Grace is freely received. It is not of uh, salvation. Is not of what we deserve. And uh, that that's one of the uh, big gains the Reformation brought five hundred years ago. Nevertheless, it puts us in a relationship where Jesus does care about what we do and how we live and how we act. So I want to explore that this morning because the third law of lordship is obedience is the result of salvation and not the cause of it. Now, I want to recap. Lordship laws, laws so far, the first one we looked at is Jesus is Lord of all or not at all. Famous Hudson Taylor said that, and it's been on my heart for quite a long time. Jesus is Lord of all or not at all, because the definition of Lord means ruler. Now, if he's not Lord of all, he's not our ruler. We're still holding that within us. Part of our rule of part of our lives and the rule of our lives, we just keep to ourselves and we don't want to submit to God. So if he is Lord of all, he has got us completely, or not at all, because we haven't submitted to all his rule in our life. So Jesus' call is the second one. Jesus' call is for radical, not casual discipleship. It's a lot easier to be a casual disciple than it is to be a radical disciple. That's in the church, sadly, as much as it is outside the church. Who would give up all that they have to go and follow Jesus? I don't hear that very often. Jesus does not mess around. When he was in Gethsemane, he did not mess around. He said, your will, not my will be done. And in that place of Gethsemane, we found out what Jesus was really on earth for and how we should live. Why? Because he gave up all when he didn't want to give up all. So that was our second uh, lordship law. Jesus' call is for radical, not casual discipleship. And so this week we're on to our third. We all must, all of us, everyone on the face of this earth, but us this morning, are in this place where we met, all men must settle a lordship issue before the Lord does for them. Let me make that clear. We settle the lordship issue of Jesus in our lives today, or the Lord will do it when he returns. That's our decision. But when the Lord does it, I don't want to be on the side that's the goats. I want to be on the side that's the sheep, the ones that have been found faithful, accepting his grace and obedient to him. Because obedience is a result of salvation, is not the cause. But we don't take salvation. We don't take grace and say, great, I've got grace. Now I can sin all the more and disobey all the more. So God has the opportunity to show me more grace. And I don't know how many times I've heard that, and it's quite a wicked um, philosophy, quite a wicked uh, belief. It's against what the Lord does for us. It's against what the Bible says. It's against Romans 6. It's called hyper grace. I don't continue to sin because I've been saved by grace. Because I have been saved by grace, therefore I will become obedient and not multiply my sin that sin may abound. No, Paul says in Romans 6. No way, you don't work that way if you're a Christian, if you want his salvation. So I need to settle a lordship issue in my life now before Jesus comes because he's going to settle it on his return. Discipleship is only ever reciprocity, and we've looked at that. <clears throat> Jesus isn't asking us to do more for him than he's done for us himself. So we're just giving back a portion, a smidgen of what he has done for us, returning him, returning it to him, and that's called obedience. Now, Jesus does not seek partnership with us, but rather ownership of us. We've looked at that already too. We own his partner. He owns us. He bought our lives at great cost. Our life does not belong to us. It belongs to him now. So we're not in a partnership, but we're in an ownership of it. You can have a look at that in 1 Corinthians 6. So what the Lord's teaching us, just to, re to recall this, we give up to go up. We're not earning our salvation. 
but obedience is required at the other side of our acceptance of, of Jesus' forgiveness. Please uh, hold on to that title. So I want to look now at the elements of lordship, through the three elements of lordship. Would you like a judgment day surprise and find out, oh, I thought I was all right. I thought I had this done correctly and then find out you messed up. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Does spiritual success matter? I even wonder if this world, let alone the church, thinks in the sense of spiritual success. The aim for that which is my benefits in heaven from the Lord. Is spiritual success more important than physical success? Well, it seems to me that it is, but it's a category that we don't think in. The Lord says, come to me. But we're getting bored in. Certainly the world does. Hear my words. But the world says, don't listen. Put into practice. But the world says, disobey. Now, at what point in our lives does avoiding Christ, not listening to him, or disobedience come in as well because we're still not committed fully to the Lord Jesus Christ. We still withhold these areas in our, in our life because the three elements of lordship are, yeah, we've come to him. The second one is, I hear, my, I hear his words and I'm, listen, I'm listening. And therefore, the third one is, uh, third word, third law is, I put them into practice. I don't disobey. Now, Matthew 7 it's quite a fearful uh, little passage. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. Let me read you just a couple of verses from it. Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There's the call for obedience. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And here's the, here's the twist in this story. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus is about relationship. Jesus is about knowing us and us working with him and him working with us. It goes on after that to talk of the wise and the foolish builders. The context for this. Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams, uh, and the streams rose and the winds blew and the beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Now, you can understand the parallels there between the rock and the sand, the, the contrasts, rather. And Jesus is saying here, build your life on me. I want a relationship with you. That's why I died. I came for a relationship, not just for rules. Obedience comes from salvation but it's not the cause of salvation. So do you want to hear? Do you want to hear, I never knew you, away from me, you evildoers? Or do you want to hear, well done, you good and faithful servant, come and share in your master's happiness? Jesus wants to know us. He wants us to walk with him, to live with him, to worship him, to obey him, to spread his word. He wants us as part of his life. Do we want him as part of our life? Do we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Or do we want to hear, I never knew you? Do we want to hear, away from me, you evildoers? Or do we want to hear, come and share your master's happiness? I don't think that's a hard thing to answer. But Jesus' life for us cost him all. And he's asking for us too to pay the same cost, but probably not with the same pain. Jesus died for relationship, not ritual. Can I get that correct? Can I get that repeated? 
Jesus wants to be our friend, not just our ruler. And he wants us to be part of his life if we want him to be part of our life. I must get this right. It puzzles me at times. I must get it right about this nature of relationship with Jesus. If you name Jesus as Lord, he's your ruler, he's your best friend, he's the one who saved you, and he asks or he shows us by being nailed to the cross. Now, wouldn't I want to spend time with him on earth? Wouldn't I want to not be too busy to spend time with him, to pray to him, to read his word, to talk with him, to be still and know that he is God? Wouldn't we want to do that? Somehow I think there's an indicator. If I'm not willing to spend time with the good Lord on earth, why would I want to spend time with him in eternity? Now, there's a stack of people in this world that don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. They deliberately avoid Jesus. They deliberately use his name as swear words. We know all that. But the thing that saddens me, and I suspect saddens the Lord, is those who name Christ as Lord, but they don't pick the word up, they don't pray, they're too busy, they're too tired, they're T-O-O -O something else that's preventing them from coming to be with the good Lord. He wants us to build our life on the rock, not on the sand. We can't say we're too busy for you, Lord, because he's already given all. Jesus died for relationship, not ritual. If we can get that today, anything else after that is, is just icing on the cake. Jesus died for a relationship with me, with Jeff Taylor. And sometimes, or quite often, that befuddles me why he did. But the point is that he did. And if it befuddles you, please take the encouragement that he did die for you. He did want you as, uh, as his friend. He does want you as his friend forever. But the tricky thing in this is, if I'm not going to want to spend time on earth with the Lord now, it's curious that I'd actually want to spend time with the Lord forever. So Jesus' Lordship. Second thing this morning is aim for influence, not affluence. Now, there's a man in the Old Testament called Jabez. He's quite significant for, <laughs> for the brevity that the good, the good Lord writes about him. But Jabez was a man who's had a has had an enduring impact because his name's written in the Bible in three verses about what he did. Jabez was, was more honourable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm, and that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Now, I don't want to go into the Old Testament customs and things because they're, they're actually things I haven't studied. But I do know this. Jabez cried out to God, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Now, I suspect that territory that he's asking God to, to enlarge is greater plot of land. But there's a, a parallel to that, a spiritual parallel to that, but would we pray with Jabez, would you give me more territory, more places of influence, and be a person that seeks influence and not affluence? Because we're in a world that tells us, pursue affluence. But if I pray the prayer of Jabez, I'm asking for my territory to increase so I have a wider influence for the Lord. Now, if you ask the Lord, for influence and pursue influence, you're going to go to some amazing places with him and you're going to go to some amazing places for him. And those places at first are going to be inside you. He'll show you things and teach you things that you didn't even know you could learn, let alone uh, apply them. Now, in our world, we think that uh, affluence is most important, but Jabez got it right. Jabez pursued that which was why 
more encompassing. So what kind of influence can you pursue that's beyond the four doors, uh, sorry, <laughs> four doors, um, beyond the, the four walls of your house? What kind of influence is there beyond the, the places you work or the people you meet with? Because God's saying, well, he answered Jabez's prayer. God's saying, will you pursue influence for me before you pursue affluence for yourself? Now, if I'm pursuing influence for the good Lord, I'm not even thinking about affluence for myself because I'm going to trust God with that because I'm putting him first. Jesus says uh, also in the um, Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and his righteousness, his rule and his righteousness, those two things. Then all these things shall be added unto you. Put God first in your life and don't worry about the, the affluence. Just go for the influence and trust him to give the increase. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So it's not going to be hard for him to bless you because you're blessing others through him. God will never give you a competitor to, your, to himself. How often have you had unanswered prayer? God will not give you a competitor to himself. So, so he's not going to answer your prayer if it's going to make it harder for you to follow Jesus. There are weeds on your seeds. You're sowing seeds, but the prayer isn't being answer, answered. The first weed on our seeds that we sow is that if we get the answer to the prayers that we're praying, we're going to be taken away from the good Lord. He's not going to give us that opportunity to, to be lost to him. So understand that. God will never give you a competitor to himself. Pray for influence for him and not affluence for you. It is impossible to give up too much for Jesus. It is impossible. Now, I want to just read to you a little bit of the... Um, the, the end of the Luke 18 reference that was read out for us. Luke 18. It was the story of the rich ruler who had so much wealth that he was uh, able to give it up for Jesus. But Jesus says, well, Peter says to Jesus, we have left all we had to follow you. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and the age to come eternal life. Jesus is saying you can't outgive God. He who has done these things, who has left home, left brothers, left his family, left all for the sake of the kingdom of God, given up all that he has. Will, will not fail to receive many more times on this earth and then eternal life. You can't outgive God, so trust him. Trust him in your pursuit of influence and don't pursue affluence because God's got your back. That's what Jesus is saying. And the third point I want to make this morning is partial obedience is merely, merely convenience. At best, at best, merely convenience is not, uh, is not offering Jesus what he asks. He who give, does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Now, it seems to me relationships are on the whole measured by time. Not necessarily, but the people that you like the most are the people you want to spend your time with. Does that parallel your relationship with Jesus? If Jesus is important to me, I'm going to be giving him time. The great leaders that I've read about, guys like A.W. Tozer, Leonard Ravenhill, Hudson Taylor, they were all men of great devotion. And they've had a great impact because they pursued influence and not affluence. And their names are going to be talked about until the day Jesus returns. 
Hudson Taylor would get up two hours before he had to start his day. And if his day was busy, he'd be up at five o'clock in the morning because he wanted to pray for two hours and read the Bible. If his day was going to be very, very busy, he'd be up at 3 a.m. in the morning because he always wanted to devote two hours to the Lord. Now, whatever, whatever Hudson Taylor did in China for about 55 years, when he's walking down the streets, the dusty roads in um, inland China, not on the nice parts of China on the coast, but on the inland parts, nobody knew then, and he didn't know then, that people would be talking about him nearly 200 years later. What he did in dusty sandals, dressed up as a Chinaman, what he did when he was sick, what he did when he was um, starving, what he did when things were going well, are all recounted and recorded. Why? Because he was a man that pursued influence. He pursued time with Jesus first. That's how you leave a legacy. You pursue influence, not affluence. Incomplete obedience is falsely selective and situational. We can choose when and where we decide not to obey Jesus. We can choose this place isn't a good place to be, but I want to stay here so I'll be disobedient with Jesus, to Jesus. Or there are people over here that don't want me to talk about Jesus. And I don't want to get in trouble for talking about Jesus, so I don't. We have our obedience is selective and situational. But if we look to Gethsemane, we see what Jesus did in both selection and situation. He's in the situation that he's facing his death. He's in the situation that, that, oh, to select choice. Gethsemane proved Jesus was not selective when asked to be obedient. Jesus, uh, Gethsemane proved that Jesus was not situational. I don't want to give any situation. I'm getting out of it now. Jesus gave all. Gethsemane is the measure of how we obey, how we decide to obey. Sadly, sadly, in uh, TV for the last 30 years, the Simpsons have been around and they've influenced too many generations now, including my own kids. I did not realise what a goose Homer Simpson was because I never watched the show. Now, Homer Simpson says, don't do anything if it's too hard. The other thing that Homer Simpson and Bart do is they always blame somebody else for what happens. They don't accept responsibility and laziness is honoured and laziness is laughed at. That's not what Jesus did in Gethsemane. He said, your will, Lord, not my will be done. So Lordship says all that we have is but a loan. That's all. Even our breath is a loan from the good Lord. Greed can never get enough, while worry always says it never has enough. It's greed or worry that's going to keep us on the side of pursuing wealth, not pursuing influence. This is where God comes in. This is where you trust him. Whoever gives up, excuse me, whoever gives up what he can't keep, the gain which he cannot lose, is the way that we should be living. Guard against greed. Wealth is dangerous. Wealth is too dangerous because it's too hard to give up. Now, there's another little story in Luke 12. Let me read it to you. It's only short. Luke 12, 14 to 21. parable of the rich fool Jesus replied man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you watch out be on your guard against all kinds of greed a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions and Jesus told them this parable the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop he thought to himself what shall I do I have no place to store my crops then he said this is what I'll do I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded of you. Then you will get what you have prepared for, him, for yourself. 
This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Guard against greed, because our breath itself is on loan from the Lord. Remember that tomorrow is not guaranteed. This man lived on earth as if the earth was all there was. And that's what we all think. What is here and now is all we see. So that's all that there is. But the Bible, Jesus' death proves that there is a tomorrow. And the tomorrow is either going to be hot or it's going to be not. To use a simple term. I want to follow Jesus. I want to obey Jesus. I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. So where greed loses, you've probably heard me say this, he who dies with the most wins. No, that's Renee Rivkin, a stockbroker from um, a decade ago, two decades ago. You've probably heard me say this, say this, life is about the accumulation of wealth in perpetuity. What absolute arrogance to think one, that you can control perpetuity and what foolishness to think that life is about the accumulation of wealth. The good Lord's asking us to pursue influence, not affluence. And John Rockefeller, when asked by a journalist, how much money does it take to make a man happy? Just one more dollar. Rockefeller, when he was alive and when he said this, he was the richest man in the world. But he just said, how much does it take to make a man happy? Just one more dollar. He never had peace. He never had rest because he's always pursuing one more dollar. Now, I want to tie this together. When we settle the issues of possessions, we will literally be able to do anything for the Lord. Because when the issues of possessions are settled, we won't be restrained from serving the Lord. They'll... They'll be our assets to help us, but they won't be our assets to rule us. Same with our relationships. Jesus' emphasis is on trust and detachment from things. The fellow that thought he could store up his wealth, eat, drink and be merry, but to, tomorrow, tonight you are, your life is required of you. Jesus said, be detached from things because that's not where life finishes. Life finishes on how we did how we hold on to things or how we've held on to Jesus. So we live between the day of plenty and the day of death. Now, eternal assets are all that matters. So I'd say let's aim for eternity. What call could God be placing on your life? Now, next week we'll be together. Praise the Lord. Next week is the end of our Lordship series. But I could not restrain myself from putting this in as I prepared this uh, sermon this week. Who of you out there, maybe there's a few of you out there, God is placing a call on your life. What is it? Ask the Lord. And if he's not placing a call on your life, can I ask you to ask the Lord, are you placing a call on my life? We weren't born on earth to just serve ourselves. We weren't placed on earth to just suit ourselves. We are called on earth, we are placed on earth for a higher purpose. Is there a higher purpose the Lord has calling upon you this day? What could he be placing on your life? Would you, in your own quiet times, would you sit down and ask the Lord? I don't know, but by golly, I'm going to ask. What call could God be placing on your life? Obedience seeds spiritual success. Obedience gets you, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in my happiness. It's interesting, isn't it? It's not come and share in my wealth, the Lord says. It's just come and share in my happiness. Because the Lord already knows that wealth doesn't make happiness. Wealth is just seeking one dollar more. See, spiritual success matters more than life itself. Spiritual success is a laying up of treasures in heaven, not treasures upon earth. What is valued among men is detestable, to, uh, is detestable to God. Luke 16, please learn that. What is valued to men is detestable to God. There are no trophy cabinets in heaven. Neither are there any leaderboards saying you did this at this time. No trophy cabinets in heaven because the things of the earth 
God doesn't care for. I like to follow the rugby league, but I can't tell you who won the grand final three years ago. I'm lucky to remember who won the grand final this year. And by next year, I will have forgotten. So we are living for the transitory. There are no trophy cabinets in heaven. Spiritual success matters. So just to conclude, if Jesus is Lord of all for you, he is your personal friend. If Jesus is Lord of all for you, trust in wealth is as hollow as trust in works. And if Jesus is Lord of all for you, love your Lord, love for your Lord will lead you to first obey your Lord in both wealth, in both wealth and works. Now, next week's our last one, and it's when Christ rules my attitude, my attitudes, he also rules my assets. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you know whose lives you want to touch today. And I pray, Lord, that you'll have each of us on our knees asking, asking you what you would have us do for you. For, Lord, you haven't put us here just for our benefit. You've put us here to bear fruit for you, Lord. May we, may we all become spiritual fruit pickers and say, Lord, what do you have for us? Amen. There's lots of special, shiny, precious new things get bought and sold in the city for lots and lots of money. But do you know what's the greatest treasure? The greatest treasure in the whole wide world is peace with God. The greatest treasure in the whole wide world is peace with God. It's the only treasure that will never fade. Even death can't take it away. Yeah, the greatest treasure in the whole wide world is peace with God. Live for happiness or live for stuff, it's all gonna fade away. You never ever feel like you've got enough because it's all gonna fade away. The trickiest toys that money can buy are all gonna fade away. Cause the greatest treasure in the whole wide world is peace with God. The greatest treasure in the whole wide world is peace with God. It's the only treasure that will never fade. Even death can't take it away. Because the greatest treasure in the whole wide world is peace with God. What if the world makes you a star? Well, it's all gonna fade away. House and the flashiest car, it's all gonna fade away. Cause earthly treasures like the morning mist are all gonna fade away. Because the greatest treasure in the whole wide world is peace with God. The greatest treasure in the whole wide world is peace with God. It's the only treasure that will never fade Even death can't take it away Because the greatest treasure in the whole wide world is Peace with God, it's the greatest treasure It's the greatest treasure Peace with God Peace with God Greatest treasure is peace with God. Well, guys, I just want to pick up on one thing that Jeff shared with us in his sermon, and he made a comment about how we're going to spend eternity with God. And if we're going to spend eternity with God, with Jesus, why wouldn't we want to spend time with Him on earth now? And I want to share a prayer. Uh, 
I'll pray in a second, but I want to share something from the Open Doors app about a lady, a widow, who actually values Jesus now on earth and willing to give up everything for him. So let me read a little bit of her story, then we'll pray for her and her situation. The title from the Open Doors app is Widow Sees God Provide After Persecution. It's hard being a Christian widow in Nepal. Her name is Siddha. She knows this firsthand. She converted from Hinduism to accept Christ when her only son was healed by him. But what should have been a joyful experience led to persecution. After her husband died, Siddha lived with her parents and her son. Her brothers and their family members abused her physically, mentally and verbally because of her new faith. Eventually, she and her son had to leave. The one thing Siddha did not leave behind was her faith. She says that she will never deny Jesus, even if she has to face severe persecution. Because of Jesus, my son is alive and healthy, Siddha says. If it had not been for Jesus, my son would have died long ago, since both doctors and sorcerers had said he will not survive. Siddha now lives with one of her church friends. She doesn't have her own source of income, so she works at a tailor shop owned by her friend. When Open Door Partners heard about her situation, they gave her some help and groceries and other relief supplies. They also pray for her and constantly keep in touch with her, encouraging her and looking out for any needs she and her son may have. When she got the groceries, Sita said, I am glad you have come all the way to meet and listen to my story. Your visit has truly encouraged me. Now I feel that I am alone, not alone on this journey. I also thank God for the groceries you have brought me. God bless you for your work. Uh, let's pray for Sita now and Nepal. Father God, we thank you and praise you that you are the eternal God. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the first and the last. You are the beginning and the end. And Father, we trust our lives into your hands. And we thank you for Sita. We thank you for her life. We thank you for her example. We thank you for her conversion. We thank you for the healing of her son. Father, we pray for your ongoing protection for her. Father, we pray that you'll help her to rejoice when she is persecuted. And we pray that you will help her to love her enemies. Father, we pray too that her son may come to have a strong faith in you as well. And we thank you for the provision of groceries and other things. And Father, we pray for all Christians in Nepal. Father, we pray for ongoing perseverance and strength and a deep trust and joy and faith in you, that the Christians in Nepal can keep storing treasures in heaven. And we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Simon. Let's uh, continue praising and praying to our great God. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely given to us, for life and health and safety, for power to work and leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, although we are the people of God, scriptures remind us that we still sin and we need to con confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus died for us and intercedes for us with the Father. So let me do that now. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, as you've washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins, dear Lord, and renew us by your grace, that we may continue to grow as members of Christ, in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. The Bible reminds us that God is slow to anger and full of compassion, and he forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his son, Jesus Christ, 
in whom there is no condemnation. I'd like to pray now for some matters closer to home. Dear Father, we do thank you um, for today. We thank you for every day that you give us, that you have a purpose and will for our lives. And Father, we ask that you would continue to give us wisdom to listen to your spirit and the will to obey, that we are not just following your words, Lord, but we are putting it into practice. And Father, please help us to do that faithfully. We thank you, dear Father, for the uh, release in some of the lockdown, some of the freedoms that have been given, um, the fact the slowing of COVID and um, the opportunity we have to be able to gather together next week, Lord, to be able to see one another face to face again. And Father, we pray for those who uh, won't be able to make it in person just yet. Um, Lord, that they would continue to uh, be encouraged by your word and through the fellowship of uh, us, even though it's through Zoom. Lord, we want to pray for those in our congregation who are going through treatment, um, who, is, who have different um, ailments and diseases, uh, different burdens that they're bearing in their bodies. And Father, we just ask that you would continue to give wisdom to the medical staff, the surgeons, and Father, that the treatments they receive will prove effective. And most of all, Father, please continue to enable us to support them uh, through prayer uh, and through practical means, through phone calls, through text messages, that these brothers and sisters know that they're not forgotten, even though they, we haven't seen them for a while. Lord, that we would continue to love and care for them in this way. Father, we ask that you would use this unusual season to draw many people to yourself. We thank you for all those who attended Steve's um, sessions on Wednesday uh, and, Lord, were, um, heard your word preached clearly and heard what it means that your son Jesus came um, to die um, for the punishment for our sins and for the gift of eternal life. And we ask, Lord, that those seeds sown over those Wednesdays will not be snatched away, uh, will not be on shallow ground, but, Lord, will bear fruit, much fruit. And, Lord, we ask that you would um, strengthen and guide our nominators as they continue to search for um, our next rector. And, Lord, that you might even now be preparing the heart of a godly man for this position and readying his family to come and join us. Father, please strengthen, bless, protect, inspire and guide um, Jeff and Steve and Simon and their families uh, for parish council, for the treasurer and for the wardens as we work together, Lord, to serve the community here at Eagleville. Father, we ask that you would help us to grow in our faith every day that you would help us to prioritise your word and time spent with you. And Lord, please continue to prompt us by your Holy Spirit, that he is the comforter and truth. And Lord, that you would enable us to walk faithfully today and every day, holding out the gospel to all those who ask. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our brother and our saviour. Amen. Amen. Hey, Simon, as, uh, as I was praying, I was remembered that, remember at the start I said that we're going to meet again next week? Um, do we have any instructions about how all of that is going to happen? Can you tell us? Any instructions, eh? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's very exciting news that we can meet again next week face-to-face uh, -face, and uh, there will also be a Zoom option as well for those that aren't ready to do that. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. Uh, so when you come to church next week, just follow normal covid protocol um, you, i'm sure you already know uh, what that is uh, but that also includes we have to wear a face mask uh, when we come to church uh, we're unable to sing still uh, but we'll continue to to listen to music and worship god in our heart and i uh, just a reminder to check in as well uh, so church will be on next week we'll have more people in the building uh, you're very welcome to come join us uh, but also 
Um, if you're not ready yet, you can also continue uh, to meet over Zoom as well. Uh, so that's what will be happening next week. Great. There is. And do you, um, actually, that reminds me, do you have any announcements about things that are happening this week? Yes, I do, actually. Yeah. Cool. Well, we have the Monday night prayer meeting uh, that is ongoing at 7.30 p.m. Uh, we also have the men's and women's devotionals that's happening on Monday morning for the men and when, uh, Friday morning for the women. And this will be the final week of these devotionals as well uh, before more regular Bible studies resume face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. uh, so you know about that. And also the, M, the Triple M uh, will be happening on Monday the 1st of November. Uh, that's Men's Monday Ministry. Uh, it will include pizza, and I believe Alan White uh, will be speaking at that night. So 7 p.m. kickoff, mm -hmm. okay, kickoff time, 7 p.m. And, uh, and please talk to Kevin, text Kevin, uh, if you're going to be inter interested in that event or coming along. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are some things that will be happening. Uh, and, of course, everything else uh, that happens during the week uh, will keep happening as well. Now we're going to have a final song okay. and we're going to continue to praise our great Lord together. And the final song will be The Life I Live. Mm. Uh, please worship at home with us. friends, thank you for joining us today on Zoom. Uh, we look forward to seeing at least some of you, we hope, next week. Uh, now stick around for morning tea over Zoom or you might choose to meet up in a, in a park or a cafe and share a cup of tea with, with someone today. 
Um, let me finish with these words of blessing from Numbers 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And dear friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.